welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, Visma Lisa Bike continue on in the major stage races as they left off last year with complete domination. I'll be looking back at Paris-Nice and Terreno Adriatico, as well as the Ronda Van Drenthe and the Welter Extra Madura. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learned that Astana could really do with speeding up their wheel changes. Puncture for Mark Cavendish, and uh, that is not ideal because the pace is on. He's got to fight his way back in. It's a change of back wheel. Oh, no, and it's, well, there's an issue with the wheel as well. Saw that. The, 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 well, part of the cassette. Looked like the bearing Fell had off. come out, yeah. It was not great, yeah. but uh, anyway, back he goes, and not ideal. Mark Cavendish there who, for what seemed like an eternity, was the fastest man on one wheel. We also learned that Mick van Dijk is a shoe-in to win big this season. Someone's lost their shoe, gathered a new one. There's Mick van Dijk. No idea what was happening there. And finally, we learned that the UCI are looking at changing their own rules when it comes to time trial helmets. Now, this presumably was off the back of the unveiling of Jira and Rudy Project's new designs last week, unveiled at Terreno Adriatico. Now, I'd like to start with an apology on this one. I, like many others, was a little taken aback, shall we say, when I saw the new Jira helmets in particular. I took to social media to say as much and jokingly said that the UCI should hire a director of aesthetics to save our sport. Well, I was only half joking because I do think that as a sport, we should be protecting our image to a certain extent. By that, I mean looking like an appealing sport to youngsters and to the general public. That helmet, for me, and I know others disagree with this, doesn't do anything to make our sport look cooler or more appealing. In fact, I feel like it would do the exact opposite, alienate people. That's not everyone's opinion, I know. My colleague John Canning, for example, pointed to a number of innovations that were happening when he was young, saying it was those innovations that got him hooked on pro cycling in the first place. What I should also have said in my post is that I'm not blaming the designers and aerodynamicists. They are working within the framework they've already been given by the UCI. Uh, the helmets not only meet safety requirements, but also the regulations of the governing body in terms of size, etc. Uh, they would have spent a lot of time and a lot of money developing these new helmets, and now they're hearing that there could be a review which outlaws them, which does seem very unfair. So, just before I get onto the rating from last week, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Are you all for this type of innovation, or do you think the UCI is right to step in to prevent things getting too extreme? Let me know in the comment section just down below. Right, with that out of the way, I shall start with Paris Nice. Traditionally known as the race to the sun, this year was anything but, at least until the last hour of the last stage. Uh, it was double Dutch at the start of the week, with Arvid de Klein taking the biggest win of his career on stage two, off the back of Coy's win the day before. Uh, de Klein's win felt well deserved after he was so consistent at the UAE Tour, and that was a massive win for his team Tudor Pro Cycling as well. The team time trial on day three was the first big shake-up on the GC, in part because of changing weather conditions. Uh, the late starters were hampered by rain, and that played into the hands of UAE Team Emirates, who ended the day filling the top four spots on GC. Avonapol, Jorgensen and the like were left with around half a minute to make up, whilst Roglic was even further back. That wasn't just down to the weather, though. Bora Hansgrohe were down to just three riders halfway through the TTT, which they paid for dearly on the run into the line. It wasn't a great day for UAE Team Emirates on stage four, though. Despite their numbers at the top of GC, they lost the race lead. Uh, Luke Plapp of Jake Alula went on the attack on the penultimate climb of the day and was joined by an informed Santiago Butrago of Bahrain Victorious. Uh, they worked really well together. The group behind didn't, and it was a real case of Group 2 dynamics, where none of the leaders wanted to spend more energy than anybody else, and there weren't really enough helpers to do the chasing for them. Butrago distanced Plapp on the climb to the finish, Montrui, uh, to take the stage win, but Plapp dug deep and did enough to go into the leader's jersey. Behind, we got our first indication that Primoz Roglic wasn't on the sort of form we'd become accustomed to seeing from him. Four days later, he'd finished the race in 10th overall, over five and a half minutes down on the winner. And it's already led to the inevitable speculation as to what this means for the rest of the season for him. On the one hand, many people would say it's very early days and that the Tour de France is a long way off, which it is. But on the other hand, I would say that this is his worst performance at his first stage race of the season since 2017. Yes, he only finished 15th at Paris Nice in 2021, but that was because of three crashes on the final stage. He'd started that stage as leader of the race. I mean, there's no need to panic. 
but we're now used to seeing Tour de France contenders winning right from the start of the season. Anyway, back to the race, and it was Olaf Coy who doubled up on stage five, the only rider in the race to win more than one stage. Definitely feels like he's going to be the sprinter to beat at the Giro d'Italia this year, even though that'll be his first ever Grand Tour. Stage six had the biggest impact on GC in many respects, and it was Matteo Jorgensen who took the initiative there. He attacked towards the top of the final categorised climb, with Skillmotor and McNulty in hot pursuit and eventually forming a very strong trio at front. A trio that quickly carved out a handsome advantage in a move that really suited all three of them. Skelmoser took advantage of being the worst placed on GC to do the least work and come away with a stage win, whilst McNulty and Jorgensen ended the day in first and second on GC. On a penultimate day, which had to be rerouted due to snow on the originally planned route, uh, that gap at the top of the GC shrunk further, whilst Vlasov, who was already a long way down on GC, sailed up the road to take his first win in well over a year. Jorgensen was distancing his compatriot McNulty. It wasn't enough to go into the yellow jersey, but it meant that just four seconds separated the two Americans going into the final day around Nice. It wasn't just about the two of them, of course. Avonapool started the day 36 seconds off the race lead, and a lot of us were expecting a characteristic all-or-nothing attack from long range to try and take the GC win. That sort of happened. Avonapool put in three big attacks on the Cote de Pay, but he never got separation from everyone. The one man constantly on his back wheel was Jorgensen, and when he realised that McNulty was distanced, he started pulling with Avonapool. Not only that, he was putting him and Vlasov, who'd also followed, into serious difficulties on the descents. Uh, Jorgensen has based himself in this area since moving to Europe and so knows these roads like the back of his hand, but that didn't make his descending any less impressive in those conditions. Vlasov was distanced at the start of the final climb of the day, and that was really the last action we saw. Havenepoel seemed to admit to himself that he wasn't going to get rid of Jorgensen, and so the two worked together all the way to the finish. Avonapool took the stage win, plus the mountains and points classification, whilst Jorgensen took the biggest win of his career. Uh, more on him in a second, but I just wanted to say that I was really pleased that McNulty at least kept a podium spot. I know he'll have been disappointed not to come away with the yellow jersey himself, but third place at Paris-Nice, not to be sniffed at. So, Matteo Jorgensen, what a win. Many of you will remember his exploit at the Tour de France last year, where he came close to winning on the Puy de Dom stage, and you may also remember how good he was at the Classics last year. Fourth at E3, ninth at Flanders. That was whilst riding for Mobistar, and at the end of his very successful spring campaign last year, he wrote a series of tweets answering the question as to how he'd been so good. And it made for really interesting reading. He talked about the importance of consistency, of how he'd regularly gone very deep in racing, but also allowed himself enough time to fully recover from those periods. He also said that he'd spent every penny of his own salary up to that point on achieving his goals. So training camps on his own, time trial equipment, nutrition, massage and motor pacing. Uh, but he also thanked his team for their support and stressed it was a great place to develop as a rider. Since joining Visma Lisa Bike this year, Jorgensen has been asked what has changed and his reply was, everything. In every detail and on every aspect, I can point out a difference, he said. Well, it's clearly paying off, isn't it? That was by far the biggest win of his career so far. And it must be a little concerning to the likes of Avonapool that Jorgensen isn't even Vinegar's final mountain domestique at the Tour. Ahead of the Tour de France, though, he'll be back on the cobbles of Belgium. And given his results there last year and the improvements he's made this, he'll be an incredibly valuable helper. But quite possibly even a rider that could win those cobble classics in his own right. Either way, this year has already been a success for Jorgensen, and you've got to be pleased for him knowing how much he's put into it. Congratulations, Matteo. Just before I move on to Torino, I wanted to let you all know that we've got our big Milano Sanremo preview coming out for you on Wednesday. It'll be the first time we see Machu Fandapool race on the road this year, and of course, it's the first monument of this season. As such, we have a t shirt in our collection, which you can find over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. I can't wait for Saturday, I've got to say. Uh, there's also going to be a big build up over on our website, globalcyclingnetwork.com, with a big written preview and some interviews in the lead up to the big day, so keep your eyes on that. Ahead of that, there's also Milano Torino and Nocera Corsa on Wednesday, and then the Grand Prix dinner on Thursday. Uh, they'll be available to watch on Discovery Plus and Eurosport, whilst the Italian races will also be available on Max in the US. OK, on to Terreno Adriatico. Unlike Paris-Nice, there was one very clear favourite for the GC, Jonas Vinigor. And there doesn't seem much point in me sugarcoating the result or building up any sort of suspense, because there was none when it came to that general classification. I think we all held out hope that we had a battle on our hands after Juan Ayuso romped to victory on the opening day's individual time trial, but all hopes were shattered by Vinigor on the first mountain test. 
That came on stage five. His team set him up beautifully, and when he attacked with 30 k's to go off the back of some great pace setting by Ben Tulit, nobody could respond. From there to the finish, his advantage only increased. Ayuso and Hindley crossed the line 1 minute and 12 seconds in arrears, and the 1 2 3 on the stage was now the 1 2 3 on GC as well. That was also the order in which they finished on Monte Petrano 24 hours later. Vinigor solo out front, 26 seconds in front of the next best. His eventual winning margin on the GC was a minute and 24 seconds, and so I took a quick look to see how long it's been since we had a bigger winning margin at that race. I didn't have to do too much research though, because it was only two years ago where Pogaccia beat Vinigor by a minute and 52 seconds. Uh, Vinigor now has seven wins to his name this season, including two general classifications. Not bad, considering he's only done 11 days of racing. Start as you mean to go on, as they say. It also meant that Visma Lisa Bike continued to break records. Yesterday, they became the first team ever to win Paris Nice and Terreno Adriatico in the same season. Outside of Vinigor, there are two riders I want to talk about from Terreno Adriatico Isaac Del Toro and Jonathan Milan. I'll start with Del Toro, an incredible talent, but also already an enigma. On both hilly days, he seemed to get dropped very easily, only to come back and be one of the strongest riders on the day. In fact, as I was watching him claw his way back to Ayuso's group on Friday, I would have bet good money that he'd had some sort of problem that had put him on the back foot. That doesn't appear to have been the case, though. He's like an extreme version of Joao Almeida, isn't he? Uh, despite working for Ayuso in the two days on the mountains, Del Toro finished fourth overall himself, well ahead of the likes of Alcid Brooks and Pidcock, two other young riders that were expecting big things from at Grand Tours in the future. Amazingly, ninth place overall marked the first time that Pidcock had ever finished in the top 10 of a World Tour level stage race. So yeah, I'm still sort of questioning where Del Toro's future lies. He's almost undoubtedly going to win a lot of big bike races in his career. I just can't figure out which type. Maybe all of them, who knows. And what about Jonathan Milan, the Italian stallion? What a beast that guy is. Now, there's so much about him that I find impressive. Firstly, he climbs incredibly well for such a big guy. Uh, so when EF were ripping it up on the climbs on the stage three in an effort to drop or at least tire out the sprinters, he was right there in the top 10. Now, the second thing I find impressive with him is that he will not be knocked out of position. Now you might think that as a given, given his size, but Filippo Ganna is of a similar build and I think he would succumb to a bit of argy-bargy in the sprint. And thirdly, it's his seated power that's crazy. After a great lead out from Pidcock on stage four, in which he almost caught Abrahamson before the line, Milan did the last few pedal strokes in the saddle and still comfortably beat Jasper Philipson. It was uphill and at the end of what would have been a very long effort for the sprinters, but nevertheless, that was exceptional. And then there was his second stage win, which came yesterday. There he found himself chasing down Suron Varenschold on his own, with all other sprinters in his wheel, and whilst he eventually got some help from his teammate Consoni, he'd already used up a lot of watts before he started his sprint. That he was then still able to outsprint everybody else was just next level stuff. There are very few sprinters who could make that sort of effort and then still have enough left in the tank to win. I definitely think he's gone up another level this season. He sort of reminds me of Marcel Kittel with his power and stature, although he's not pretty on a bike, but certainly effective. Uh, the other sprints at the race were won by Philipson and Bauhaus, but it felt like it had been a frustrating week for the Belgian. On stage three, he crashed himself out, taking a few others with him, whilst yesterday he looked on almost in disbelief as he watched Milan getting the better of him in that sprint. Not a disaster by any respect, he took a stage win after all. I just think he was hoping for and expecting more from himself. Uh, meanwhile, at the Ronde van Drenthe yesterday, we did see some splits in the crosswinds, but despite Puck Peters' best efforts in motivating everyone in the front group, uh, things had come back together ahead of the final clobble climb. British champion Pfeiffer Georgie created her own splits in the closing kilometres, flying through the corner so quickly that gaps opened up all over the place behind her. Uh, she was working for Charlotte Cole, but with the Dutch woman distance early on that final climb to the line, you do wonder if they'd been better off allowing Georgie to go for her own result. Either way, I don't think she'd have been able to do much to challenge Lorena Vibes. She kicked as soon as they got onto the cobbles, immediately opening up a huge gap over Lidl Trek's Elisa Balsamo. Uh, Vibes crossed the line two seconds in front of the former world champion, whilst Puck Peterson was a further two seconds adrift in third. That was Vibes' fourth consecutive win at that race and the 75th of her career so far. Ellen van Dijk took victory on the closing day's individual time trial at the World at Madura yesterday. Just five months after giving birth to her first child, she finished 24 seconds in front of teammate Brodie Chapman. Uh, she also took sixth place on the GC, but that general classification was won by Marai Meyering of Movistar 
who'd established her lead with a solo win on stage two. That day, she'd followed an attack at the top of a climb from Guy Riolini, dropping her on the subsequent descent and reaching the finish line with a 22-second advantage. Uh, that stage and the GC were the first two wins in the career of Meilering, and it was a great race for Movistar, who won stage one with their Canadian rider, Olivia Barril. Right, that is all for this week's racing news show. I'll be back with Cy for that big Milano San Remo preview show with you on Wednesday. Cannot wait for Saturday. It's going to be a belter of a finale, of course. Thank you very much for watching. I will see you again soon.